Okay, if we haven't met, my name is Taj, and I'm one of the pastors, surprise, at this church. <laughs> you know, in case you can't tell, football season is here. Am I right? It's go time. And everywhere, no matter whether it's the NFL or the youth leagues, teams are being formed together. Coaches and players come together and decide to form a team. And they'll go after a single goal. In the NFL, it might be the Super Bowl. In other ones, it might be the championships of their league. But they all kind of get together and get ready to play. Now, some people, you have to get together and start to be with that team. But a lot of people won't join that team. I want to ask the coaches out here. Christy and I were coaches in high school. Any coaches out here, I just want to ask you this one question. If someone doesn't show up to practice... Are they on your team? No. I didn't hear you, coaches. <laughs> are they on your team? No, they are not on the team. <laughs> so those who can't commit to practice aren't really going to be on the team. Now, at the start of every season, players must to commit to themselves and first study the coach's playbook because they have to know what the coach is thinking and what plays he wants them to run. And then they have to practice them and to be able to execute those plays. That's what their role is. And only then are they ready to play the game, right? Now imagine we show up to an NFL game on some Sunday and we're wearing a jersey like this. And imagine we make it onto the field. And imagine we line up for a play. <laughs> it's going to be awesome, right? I mean, we're ready. But, but, but the only problem is this. I don't know what the play is. And we don't know what we're doing next. And all of a sudden, the ball gets hiked. And we're running around like a fool going, whoa. And we just get wrecked. <laughs> flattened on the turf. Now, are we on that team? No, we are not on that team. Not at all. And we have no business being out there. All we do is sit there and watch on Sunday mornings. Yeah, it's kind of like if we just show up here on Sundays and watch the people on stage, but we don't practice any of this. We have to learn God's plays and practice them every day. Because we may call ourselves Christians, but often we're making plays for the other team. And we're wrecking our life and the lives of those around us. That's not the way you want to play this game. And if you're like me, that happens way too much. But Venture Family, that's why we have Coach Jesus. Because he came to teach us a new way to live, to live in love. Now we get to study his plays and learn how to live in love. That's why Pastor Matt hugs us and tells us he loves us because he follows Jesus' plays. And that's why we hug each other, and tell each other we love each other because we follow Jesus' plays. Love you too, JP. Coach. <laughs> Six months ago, we started a weekly men's team sitting up here <laughs> where we learned to run the plays of Coach Jesus and become more loving. We talk about his ideas and how to run his plays. And it's really transforming our lives and creating these deep bonds between us. Before we were frustrated and alone, but now we're living in Jesus's upside down kingdom. Our, v our venture teams have formed uh, other ones with family or friends who just text or FaceTime each other because not everybody can get together in person every week. It doesn't really matter how your team gets formed. It's just important to be in a team and get going. So there's many ways to be part of a team. 
And today we're going to wrap up this sermon series on the Upside Down Kingdom with my message called Team Jesus. Many of us have been impacted from the incredible uh, sermon, uh, Jesus' incredible sermon on the mount about how to live in this world following Jesus. He was teaching his followers a new way to live. So Jesus' way of living in love is completely opposite of how the world lives, right? Christy and I have been studying how Jesus lived for the past few months, and it's really taken us to the whole new level, guys. The exciting news for us today, Venture, is that we're going to be bringing these teachings to our groups, okay? So we all get to do this together in teams. We good with that? Let's do it. Jesus' incredible three-chapter sermon starts in Matthew chapter 5 and rolls all the way to Matthew chapter 7. Three full chapters. Jesus closed out his sermon in Matthew 7, 21, saying, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. What Jesus is saying here is that people can act and look religious and still not be following Jesus in love. He's like, don't just buy the jersey, bro, and run around like a fool, making Christians look like they're crazy. Come on, man, you don't even know the plays. Learn how to live like Jesus by loving the people in your life better. Jesus' new commandment is to love each other. I've said this before, but did you know that 63% of Americans identify as Christians? And only 4% of Americans actually follow Jesus. That's a shockingly low number. And if you think about it, that means right there, 96% of Americans don't follow Jesus. That's a sad stat. They've never committed to follow Jesus as their coach or showed up to team practice in any way. But this is our wake-up call venture. Let's figure out how to live like Jesus by loving each other in teams. You're wondering, what's under there, Taj? I'm going to show you. bag of sand and a rock. Jesus ended his sermon by illustrating building our houses on his rock versus the world's shifting sand. In Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Jesus said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds his house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rain and floods come and the winds against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus was saying that life can be hard, guys, with or without him. So build your life on Jesus. 
Make Jesus your life's foundation. Speaking of foundations, I was talking to this real estate investor one time. We had a a rental house in uh, Fresno. And he said, Taj, the one thing that I didn't realize, the house looked okay on the outside, but on the inside, it was built on a bad foundation and the concrete had crumbled and turned into sand. He said, Taj, you could walk in, push on a wall, and the wall would move. (laughs) It looked okay from the outside, but that house was not okay. That house needed a new foundation. We all know that. Jesus' illustration of building your house on the rock teaches us to build our lives on Jesus' way of living in love. Rock foundations, you see, are steady and they will not move through the storms that life throws at us. And Jesus was clear when he said in John 16, 33, I have told you all this that you might have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus was inviting all of us to, build, to hold on to him because storms in life are coming. He's saying don't build our lives on the world's shifting sands and get blown away. He's the rock and he will never be moved. And many of us at Venture have walked through storms in life and been with the rock by our side, and he has not moved, right? Can I see a hand, show of hands, all those who know that? Yes, we know that. We live it. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Jesus is calling us all to come join Team Jesus. And the good news is, unlike the NFL, which is cutting down to 53 players this week, I think, Jesus' team is unlimited. He has room for all of us. Okay? He has the bandwidth to coach all of us to reach our full potential. No matter what you've done or what's been done to you, you are wanted by Coach Jesus. And he's never going to cut you from his team if you don't make it to practice. He will just lovingly encourage you to come the next day (laughs) because his call is to come follow me. Three simple words. Come follow me. We work together in teams because following Jesus is a team sport developed by Jesus for his followers. No one plays football alone because you would get crushed. The same is true for us in this Christian walk. We don't do this alone. And if you think about it, Jesus always worked in teams. In fact, Jesus is part of the Trinity. The greatest team of all Time. There's a lot of debate about other goats, but this is the goat. The Trinity is the goat, period. Eternal, period. God, Jesus, and God's Spirit always move together as one. Always. On an NFL team, the rookies stick side by side with the veterans so they can learn how to execute the plays. Our Christian team is the same. Every rabbi or coach, like Jesus, has what the Bible calls his yoke. Somebody say yoke. Yoke. A yoke is a Hebrew idiom for his set of teachings, his way of reading scripture, 
his take on how to thrive as a human being doing God's work. The yoke was a piece of wood that was shaped to fit around the shoulders of a lead ox and a younger ox so they could move together, united. Always together, always united under the yoke. Jesus' yoke allows us to follow his every move, aligned and being transformed in our lives with him, completely aligned to Jesus at all times. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Picture yourself right now taking his yoke on you. Let me teach you because I am humble and a gentle heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. So Jesus is saying that my teachings, my way of thriving as a human isn't a bunch of rules. It's easy and will give your soul rest. If you're tired and worn out this morning, consider following Jesus more closely every day. Now, Jesus' team is a spiritual team, and his team is developed by his coaching in what is called spiritual formation. And formation simply means being formed. And John Mark Comer said in his book, Practicing the Way, we are all following somebody or something. We need to decide who or what we are a disciple of. Jesus or the world. We're all being formed every day, guys. Let's think of the things that are forming us. The social media we follow. The TV shows we watch. The news feed we consume. The friends we hang out with. The music we listen to. All of it. You get the picture, though. Jesus said, come, follow me, not the world, me. Jesus invited people to apprentice under him into a whole new way of living. Let's pause and ask God right now. Let's just bow our heads. Lord, who or what am I? following. I've heard that we're all following somebody or something. So show me who am I a disciple of? You, Jesus, or the world? From now on, I choose you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. One good way to see which team you're actually on is uh, based on this new commandment that Jesus gave, we talked about, to love each other. It's really good because in John 13, 34, Jesus said, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Because the bottom line is if you're following Jesus, you're becoming more loving. Coach Jesus drew up some amazing plays to show us how to love each other better. Let's study this play from 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. To find out how to love one another better, it reads, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. 
It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. So today we're going to take a little test. Don't get nervous. If you have your pen and and piece of paper out, just write one through ten in your notes. If you don't, just keep a mental track in your mind. And I'm going to give you two options. You're either going to write down J for Jesus next to number one, or a W for the world. And then we're going to add it up at the end. So one through ten in your your little uh, pieces of paper there. Are you ready? Okay, let's start. So Jesus' way versus the world's way. Number one, I am patient. Versus... I'm agitated. (laughs) You spend most of your time patient with those around you, your friends, your family, your coworkers, people around you. Or no, I'm pretty agitated at all these people. (laughs) J or W, mark yourself, be honest. It's only between you and him. We're not showing anybody else your test results. (laughs) Number two, I'm kind versus I'm mean. My actions towards people, I'm kind to them. Caring for them. Give yourself a J. Or nope, I'm pretty mean. I'm sarcastic all the time. I just rude. I'm just mean all the time. W. (laughs) Number three, I'm content versus I'm jealous. Content with my life, good with my life. Or man, I'm staring at Instagram and I'm just like, oh, need that. Amazon clicking. Oh yeah, got to get two of those. Ship them. I need them here tomorrow. (laughs) Number four, I'm humble versus I'm arrogant and boastful. You're the person on Instagram posting about your latest meal, fit, whatever you got on, where you're vacationing, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Brag, 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 brag. (laughs) Or no, I'm humble, I don't put all that on there. Five, I'm gracious versus I'm rude. Gracious person versus I'm rude in general. Six, I'm considerate versus I'm self-centered. Just think about me, 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 what I want. I don't consider others. The only way to be happy in this world is to consider me. Don't consider anybody else. You get a big W. If you're considerate, (laughs) you get a J. Number seven, I'm self-controlled, versus I'm easily provoked. I'm just always on edge, always provoked by people. They could look at me wrong. They looked at me wrong. (laughs) W. I'm forgiving. Number eight, or I'm resentful. I'm forgiving of people, my family, my friends, people at work, whatever things have happened to me in the past, I'm forgiving. Or now nah, I, I harbor that stuff, man. It eats me up, sticks with me for years. Last two, number nine, I'm moral versus I'm immoral. Kind of follow God's ways more. Or, nah, I kind of got to do what I need to do to get things done, so I just do it. Number 10, I'm truthful versus I'm dishonest. If I need to get things done, I just kind of do it my way. It could be a little shady, but it's my way. That's a big dub. (laughs) Or if you're truthful, it's more of a J. Okay, now score yourselves. Just see where you are at this point. Just be honest between you and Jesus. Nobody else is looking unless the person next to you is looking. I don't know about that. but. But if you're like me, you probably scored like, when I first did this test, I'm all on the world side. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know this stuff. I'm like, what? Did, what? How? I didn't even know you could live that way. But Jesus showed me that I could live that way. And over time, he's transformed me. So you can become a more loving person following him. If we want to be transformed into people of love, we need to be on team Jesus. And this has frustrated church leaders for so long. Because many people say yes to Jesus, but then they don't really want to Follow him. That's boring. But following him is the good stuff. So how do we follow him and allow his love to transform us? In the book, Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer, he lays out the nine plays that Jesus ran all the time. These are the nine plays that Jesus actually practiced himself to live in his upside-down kingdom. We'll get into more details in our groups, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of each one. Just imagine 
for yourself if each one of these was part of your life on a regular basis? How would it change things? Play number one, Sabbath. Somebody say Sabbath. Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath means take one day a week to do no work, no chores, no errands, not even shopping on Amazon. <laughs> God designed us to stop, rest, delight, and worship one day a week. Try taking a nap, walking on the beach, be with friends and family, eat food that you love. Take a complete break from your phone and just chill. <laughs> Imagine 24 hours of rest, focusing on God and doing the things you delight in. Most of us desperately need this. We need to shut off the world for one day and start living that beautiful 24-6 life that Jesus lived. Not the crazy 24-7 that the world demands us to live every single moment, every single day. No, man. It's not for us. Play number two, solitude. Someone say solitude. Solitude, solitude means being by yourself, alone with God. It also includes silence. Imagine taking time out of every day or multiple times a day to be alone, quiet with God, to not have your phone and to just sit with Jesus. Ah, that's good. Play number three, prayer. Most of us do this already, but there's a lot of different types of prayer and ways to pray. Talking to God, all that is, prayer, it's a fancy word for talking to God. Talking to him multiple times a day is good. Try it. It can be quick. He doesn't need you to go on and on like me right now. It can be just like one word. Jesus needs you. Okay. Play number four, fasting. Someone say fasting. fasting. Weekly fasting is one of the most important and powerful practices of Jesus, and sadly, it's the most neglected one in the Western church. Fasting from food is literally praying with our whole body. You feel it everywhere when you fast. You learn to be joyful even when you don't get what you want. And you learn to identify with those who are hungry every day. Play number five, scripture. This practice is probably familiar to most people here. But just like with prayer, there are all sorts of ways to read scripture slowly and prayerfully, out loud with others around you. Deep study, memorizing verses and more. Team Jesus, we need to learn from his playbook, the Bible. Play number six, community. To put it simply, we were never meant to follow Jesus alone. In Genesis 2.18, God said in the Taj translation, it's so not good for this dude to be alone. Our culture is all about individualism. It's me, 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 me. But this has led to a loneliness crisis and a mental health crisis. And it's a death blow to any kind of serious formation into Christ-like love. Venture groups start this week. Yay. And if you haven't joined one yet, there is still time. So join a group. And to quote Pastor Christie, don't just sign up online. Actually, go to the group. <laughs> and don't just go once or twice. High five and out. <laughs> go to all the sessions to experience Christian community. Because it can literally change your life. Tell it like it is, Pastor Christie. Can you tell she runs our groups and sees what's really happening out here? Thank you. Number seven, generosity. Seven out of nine. Surprisingly, this is one of the most joyful of all the practices. Once you're able to live below your means rather than chronically maxed out and overextended, it opens us up to all sorts of new possibilities. It allows you to give freely like God does. Imagine a life where you could help 
others who are in need of some extra money. Play number eight, service. Jesus said it this way, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. But most of us wanna be served. The crazy thing about serving others though is that it has the power to change us. It sets us free from our entitlement and self-obsession. And play number nine, witness. Somebody say witness. The ninth and final play that Jesus ran was witnessing. Our goal isn't to go convert everyone, but we are to tell others about our before and after story of what following Jesus has meant to us. It gives people hope. The best way to do this is through hospitality. Jesus invited people to eat with him all the time, if you think about it. All we need to do is just invite people to hang out and eat together, that's it. And then talk about our story. Imagine what the world would look like if we all did that. These are the nine plays that Jesus constantly ran. And if we model them, we'll be more like him. It may sound overwhelming to think you need to run all nine plays at the same time. Don't do that. Just run one play. These are not more things to cram into your 24 seven schedule that's busy, busy, busy. Most of these actually help you eliminate things from your life and give more space to Jesus. Imagine that 24 six life with one day free and more space for Jesus. Does that sound good, Venture? Remember this, being formed into the image of Jesus is hard, slow, and the kicker is we're not in control. Change happens little by little. Start by being on Team Jesus and implement some of these plays into your life. And one day you'll look at yourself and you go, hey, I'm not as angry as I used to be. Or, hey, I'm more patient than I used to be. Or, man, I used to hate that person. Now I have forgiveness. It's really true. It's in my heart. It's changed me. All types of people follow someone or something else besides Jesus and call themselves Christians. But let's not be like them, Venture. Let's be real. Let's not just wear the jersey on Sunday, come on. Let's follow Coach Jesus' playbook and actually run his plays to become more loving like him. Remember this, our last thing. Jesus wants all of us to be on Team Jesus.